G'day folks. Today, we're taking a look at a workstation that's pretty old, but still fascinating to check out. This is the HP Z1 All-in-One from 2012. Now, before we discuss this machine specifically, I do want to check out HP's website on this machine, which they still have up, apparently. I'm kind of surprised by that. Their kind of cheesy tagline is power without the tower, and that's definitely true here because it features a full-fledged Intel Xeon processor and discrete GPU, although it's on an MXM card, not necessarily a full PCI Express GPU, which is a little disappointing, but considering the form factor, it kind of makes sense. It also mentions it actually opens up very easily to let you swap out parts and make upgrades with no tools required to some extent, of course. So you could upgrade the memory, the graphics, the SSD, generally speaking, without the use of screwdrivers, if you will. You can kind of get an idea as to the upgrade potential based on this picture here, which actually looks pretty enticing. You'll soon see that once we get past this part of the video for just the sake of coverage. Now, this machine had options for Linux, Windows 7, and Windows 8, although obviously nowadays I'm running Windows 10 on it, which is kind of a bit of a push, but it's not really too bad. But, you know, it is what it is. As you can see, some of the available processors you could have ordered this machine with included the basic i3 configuration, which I don't know why you'd want that, all the way up to as high end as the Xeon E3 1280V2. Now, these are all based on the Socket 1155 platform, and this uses the Intel C206 chipset, which allows support for the Xeon processors to be used with the socket. It's kind of an entry-level sort of high-end workstation server chipset that Intel provided back in the day. And nowadays, that's still kind of the case. They still use the CXXX moniker for servers and high-end workstation chipsets. But uh, you, get what, you get what I'm talking about there. Has four memory slots up to 32 gigabytes of 1600 megahertz ECC DDR3, which was actually quite a decent amount. Of course, if you were running a consumer processor, you couldn't use ECC, so you were limited to 8 gigabytes of memory, which is kind of a curious limitation. I don't know why that's the case. You would think maybe at least 16 gigs, but it's whatever. It does have two internal 6 gigabit per second SATA ports for storage, and one of the other SATA ports is the 3 gigabit per second version for the optical drive. Back in the day, you could have had options for a SATA hard drive at 7200 RPM, a 10,000 RPM uh, SATA drive, or an SSD, which probably would have cost an exorbitant amount of memory, I'm sure. The hard drives in question were also 2.5 inch, typically, although you could put in a 3.5 inch if you wanted to. Although, for a machine like this, it might be nice to use the two internal 2.5 inch bays for SSDs for uh, faster performance. Now, it does have integrated graphics in the form, in my case, of the HD Graphics P4000, because I have a Xeon, and we'll get into the, which one I have here in a little bit. But mine also has a discrete NVIDIA Quadro Q1000M graphics card. And those are pretty nice, but it features two gigs of DDR3 video memory. So it's not brilliant by any means. It probably wouldn't be the most brilliant for games anyway. And they ended driver support quite a while ago. So it's not the most useful, but it could be interesting to see what this thing could do as far as gaming is concerned, you know, kind of kind of leading towards a new video, of course. Has a two megapixel webcam, which obviously this machine has. They say it has dual cone front facing stereo speakers on this line right there, which is definitely true. You can see there's a speaker here and a speaker there and are covered by like a little metal mesh grill. And ports are actually pretty good on this machine if you actually consider what this machine has to offer. One of them is actually a Firewire port, which I'm kind of surprised is on a machine this new. But it also features USB 3, USB 2, has a card reader, has a display port output, has an SPDIF output, and so on and so forth. And of course, a DVD drive, because back in 2012, that was still uh, frequently used to install software and operating systems. It has a built-in 400 watt power supply at 90% efficiency, which is pretty good actually. Probably better than an external brick, which that would be a huge brick if that was the case. And from there on, it's just the rest of the sales brochure, which is not very in-depth since they talk about programs like Adobe Premiere, spelled the wrong way, and Sony Vegas, which no longer is called Sony Vegas because uh, Sony sold the rights off of the Vegas software and the uh, movie whatever programs that they have 
to Magix a long time ago. I don't know if that's still the current owner of that software, but it doesn't really matter too much. So let's go ahead and check out this machine a little bit more in depth. Okay, you're gonna have to forgive me. I'm using the wide angle camera for this portion and it's not gonna look the greatest until I bring it closer, so I apologize. But it's actually pretty easy to get into this machine as HP stated on their website. It's actually quite well thought out. So since this machine has such an adjustable stand, both in height and angle, you can actually tilt it down to where it's pretty much flat. Now, unfortunately, this machine does not have a touchscreen, or else this would be an absolutely killer feature of the Z1. I don't know if they had it as a feature in later models, but I don't believe it was ever a feature on the first generation Z1 like this one is. So besides that, to get in this machine, there are two spring-loaded little latches on the bottom. So then you open those, and the entire machine opens up on a gas charge little lift here. And here you go, you're in the machine. Everything is accessible to service, upgrade, or whatever you wanna do, even just looking at the machine. So let's go ahead and check it out. So I'm basically gonna gloss over the parts on the display because they're not very interesting. This does have a 1440p display. It's the LG LM270WQ1 specifically in this machine. And if you wanted the HP part number, it is 6711197-001 if you ever had to find a replacement. And it looks like it's actually not the most difficult to take out and replace. It looks like surrounding the perimeter is a bunch of torque screws and you could probably easily lift this out and replace it should you need to. There's also a label on the back which shows the uh, I.O. layout and where stuff is located on the motherboard in a sort of basic fashion, but it's still nice to see. And of course, there's the LVDS control board there. So not too bad of a layout. And well, that just leads us into the rest of the components. Now, one of the big features of this particular configuration is the graphics card. As you can see, it has this big baffle and it's branded as NVIDIA Quadro. This is actually an HP specific part, by the way, it's not custom by NVIDIA in any way. It's just, well, nice looking. This has, again, the NVIDIA Quadro Q1000M discrete GPU. It's a two gig DDR3 graphics card on an MXM bus. I believe it's MXM 3.0B. So you could probably throw in a newer GPU like a GTX 700M series and get pretty decent performance if you wanted to play uh, games rather than try to use a workstation GPU to play games. Of course, besides that, there's the power supply, which looks like it could actually very easily be swapped out. You just gotta unplug the main connector for power. And I believe this also powers some extra components like maybe the fan and whatever. And then you could just easily swap this out by using this handle here. And it, you could do the same thing with the GPU, but this thing's got uh, broken housing, so I'm not gonna go doing that because I don't feel like trying to play with the latch to try to get it back inside there because, um, fun fact actually about this particular machine, the graphics actually came to me dead. And curiously, the previous person who had gotten this machine from surplus from the university this machine came from because you know this was obviously a university owned computer who else would buy a big machine like this and he had managed to or the previous person who had gotten it from the university before he sold it off to the other person that it sold it to me had actually cleverly taken out the gpu and shoved it like in between here without actually connecting it to the mxm slot but still connected the housing to power so it looked like the gpu was actually working but you never saw it in the device manager well, Curious Me found out that when you plug it into the MXM slot, it was producing a boot chime. It, or not boot chime, but like, you know, a post beep. And of course, go figure, it was actually correlated to the video. So over here, amongst all my other mess, this is the original GPU, which is dead. And it's actually quite a complex housing if you take a look at it. There you can see the MXM GPU itself. Now you could swap this out for another MXM GPU with the same form factor. It's not restricted to just a quadro. It's just the housing is branded as a quadro. But there's some quite big heat pipes that go over here to this baffle. Now one of the uh, sore points of these is this will actually crack like this. That's why I'm not taking out that other one because it's a chore to get these things back in there without having a lot of problems. But yeah, it's a pretty substantial housing if you think about it. Now, a nice feature is the internal USB. I don't know who would use this, but you could probably use like a keyboard receiver, although reception would kind of be bad. 
or you could use a wireless dongle or a USB stick for booting. I'm not sure who would actually use this, but it's nice that it's at least there, HP thought of that. Now, beside that are the two speakers, which as you can see, they have two small cones that fire out and they sound all right. They're not brilliant, but they sound all right. Definitely serviceable. There you can see one of the IO boards. There's another fan that can be easily removed with a tab. So that's pretty nice. And that fan helps to direct air over the storage as well as over the RAM. And in this case, you can see the two two and a half inch bays or one three and a half inch bay that you could technically customize to get your storage in here, as well as the other SATA bus, which is three gigabit per second to connect the optical drive. But yeah, this would be the six gigabit per second bus over here. Of course, right at the moment just has a MX a series crucial SSD in it. There's the RAM, which is in this case, 16 gigs of DDR3 ECC. Then the dreaded clear CMOS buttons right there. Interesting piece to help direct the cables so they don't pinch. I didn't put that there. That was probably an HP added dealio. So a little chipset heat sink up here. And there's where the main power connector is. Now underneath here is the main CPU heatsink. This machine features the Xeon E3 1245V2, which is a four core, eight thread CPU running at 3.4 gigahertz. Now if the core count and the clock speeds sound familiar to you, this is basically a rebadged Core i7-3770 processor, which is not a bad thing in any way. That's just how it is. So hopefully you're used to that chip. Of course, above that, which is kind of a bad placement in my opinion, is the wireless card. This features Intel's Centrino N6230 uh, wireless card. I don't know if there's like a whitelist, but hopefully not. So you could probably swap that out with something newer. But also curiously, beside that, there are a couple of extra PCIe X1 style connectors, which feature 10 watts of power each. Now, I don't know if that would be useful for other like Bluetooth modules, because I don't think this would have Bluetooth built into it, even though it's got uh, two wires. I don't think that was a thing in this model. It was probably an option, but not configured. And then when you're done doing whatever you need to do inside the machine, you just simply close this up and there you go. Now it is kind of a chore to get the display back up. There's a little button here. Since this kind of clips into place, and it's like service mode. So you have to kind of hold the button down and then angle this, this uh, screen back up, which takes a lot of strength, actually. I'm kind of surprised. You would think that they would make it a little bit easier, but I mean, when you think about it, all that componentry is stuck inside the screen. It makes sense that it's super heavy because this thing pretty much is a, <laughs> like a big metal behemoth. If you, I don't know. Anyways. The back has a nice brushed metal finish, which looks quite sharp. You can also see one of the Wi-Fi antennas there. And I think the other Wi-Fi antenna is right here, but it could be wrong. It could be placed elsewhere, but it would kind of make sense if it's there. This is also a wheel, which is used as a bit of a privacy shutter for the webcam. So you can actually, it won't show up very well because of the reflections, but you could basically use that to swivel the camera out of the way as a privacy measure long before many modern devices use that kind of feature which is kind of funny, HP went back on that. Now underneath here is a lot of the main I.O. of the machine, which you can't see because it's covered by the stand. But if I angle my camera underneath here, you can get a look at it. So that's the main power input there. That's the display port output there. That's ethernet. There's some audio outputs there for microphone in, line in and line out, SP diff out, and there's four USB 2.0 ports underneath there. There's the power button, there's a hard drive access light, there's the eject button for the slot loading optical drive, which is right here. Down below that is the card reader, which supports XD, MMC, memory stick, and SD cards. There's the lone Firewire 400 port, which is again, very interesting to see on a machine this new. Two USB 3 ports, headphone, and microphone jacks. And, well, that's your lot. That's everything you get on a machine just like this. Now I don't exactly have a lot on this machine, it's just a clean copy of Windows 10, but I'll still go ahead and power it up so that way you can get a look at it on. 
Now, this does technically support UEFI, but I believe it's a older UEFI standard with no secure boot, so it looks kind of tacky when it turns on. As you can see, it's kind of squished. But this BIOS 2.57, which is the newest that this machine ever got from, I think, April 2013... And yeah, that GPU flashing is normal. I don't know why it does that. It's just a quirk of the BIOS. I don't know if it's actually the GPU that's on its way out. I couldn't tell you for sure. It would lead me to believe the latter, like the GPU is about to go out. And it actually almost did that because when I turned this machine on in preparation for the video, the screen was black. So I'm having a good time right now at the discrete GPU and the Z1 all-in-one. And yes, I know the quality looks bad because I'm using the wide angle, whatever. So I'm going to see if, oh yeah, there's some lines in the text down there. That doesn't bode well for this thing. Um, I'm going to just try enabling low resolution video. And I'm going to see if that gets this thing to work. I'm not sure if something's just going on with the discrete GPU or what. Because, um, yeah, this happens. Now that flashing is normal. It's, it did that with the integrated graphics as well. So that's just a quirk of this machine's BIOS. But yeah, this is exactly what it's doing. It just doesn't show anything on the screen when it starts up. So something tells me I'm gonna have to run display driver uninstaller on this thing. Yay! All right, Athlon Silver meme to the rescue. We got a USB drive. Let's go and stick that in. Let's get that on here. We're gonna start this up in safe mode with no networking. Oh, this has an old BIOS update file on it from that. Uh, first gen i5 computer okay luckily safe mode works okay cool that works all right um let's grab this bring that on there yeah the ssd is not particularly fast in this machine but it gets the job done all right there is usb port there we go okay so i'm just gonna hope that i can get this thing going with uninstalling the display driver so let's hope that that's all we need. All right, so far so good. We do have a desktop. So I guess now the question is, can we reinstall the display driver? Actually, I should probably disconnect this from the internet before it starts doing anything, before Windows gets any bright ideas. Oh, I do have the Quadro driver. Thankfully, I have that. I'm just going to try reinstalling that offline. In the meantime, um, let's close that out. Let's see if I get lucky. SSD power. Definitely. If this doesn't work, I'm going to go check the actual connection of the GPU. Maybe it's come loose. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's connected enough to which it's outputting a display. It sees it in Windows, so... I don't know what's going on. That's really strange. So clean installation. Let's see if that works. Anyways, back to this uh, video. I don't want to be going on that tangent too long. I digress, but I got it working again. So hopefully it works long enough for this video to which we can actually finish it off because I kind of want to keep this machine working for the video and hopefully a future video where we play some things on this thing's quadro gpu i do plan on eventually wanting to swap it out for a like another mxm gpu hopefully something that's got better driver support i don't know what i'm going to go to but hopefully the market will calm down a little bit on gpu pricing so i can actually get something which would be kind of nice so there you can see the specifications xeon e3 1245v2 at 3.4 gigahertz 16 gigs of ram there and if i go over to display you can see the resolution 2560 by 1440. And if I go under here, you can see it's the NVIDIA Quadro 1000M. Driver support on these is actually pretty poor. I was kind of impressed to see that. Uh, I don't know exactly what series these are based on. I would assume it's like the same thing as the GTX 600 series. So it definitely did not get the kind of driver support you would expect. It ended in 2017. Now, I'm sorry about the flicker. There's nothing I can really do about that. The refresh rates mismatch so that kind of sucks but i digress uh yeah driver support's not very good um so that's probably one of the reasons why i would switch out this gpu for something else maybe a higher end radeon if they still did mxm cards as new as i think they did or perhaps maybe like i said like a gtx 700m series or maybe perhaps something a little newer 
That way I get better driver support and better game support. But, I mean, right now it's fine. It'll get the job done. I guess we can check out the camera briefly since I didn't block it. This is not the best, but it gets the job done if you needed it for some kind of Zoom conference. And I'm sure that's probably why these machines are a lot of money right now. Not just because they're freaking heavy. But we're not going to dwell on that too much because it's not a very good camera. Now, the speakers are actually decent. They're not brilliant, but they're decent. They do get quite loud. So I'll definitely give them that. But yeah, not the most brilliant sounding speakers. But anyways. So at least for the moment, that's all I can share because I don't have a lot of software installed. Like I said, it's just pretty much a clean install of Windows 10. And that's fine because i actually planning on doing like a separate gaming video on this machine or something like that. So, you know, for the moment, that's what I really wanted to show was the hardware. It's a very fascinating machine from the day and still very capable even these days if your expectations are in the right mindset. But obviously it's going to take some money and some time and effort to get this machine into a spot where it could actually still technically be used for a pretty interesting purpose, like a gaming all-in-one with a Xeon processor in it. Uh, I don't know about other CPU compatibility. Um, I didn't look up a lot more than the HP like brochure, like the online sales brochure. So I don't really know if this machine will take like the higher end six core chips. I think those are socket 2011. So this might be stuck to a four core eight thread chip because Intel, but I mean, this was 2012. So I guess you can't be too hard on Intel, but you know, I can still give my thoughts where they count, but I digress. I think for now, that'll wrap up this video on this machine. So until the next one, I hope you all enjoyed. If you like what you saw, of course, you know what to press. If you didn't like it so much, well, then you also know what to press. Get subscribed down below. Click that bell so you don't miss when I upload new videos. And with all of that having been said, thank you all for coming to watch. And I'll catch you all in the next one.